Hello out there, everyone, and welcome back to another Fusion 360 Tech Tuesday. I am your host, Jason Lichtman, and I'm accompanied by Brad Tallis on the keyboard answering your questions. We are both coming to you live from Denver, Colorado. Today's live stream is going to cover a topic that I think is really awesome. We're going to be covering my favorite best practices for a multi-setup toolpathing project. And for today, we are going to cover how to create all the toolpaths you would need and also show you the tip and trick, the best practice that I'm talking about for this particular mold. This is an aluminum mold and we're gonna go and create it in Fusion and we're gonna also add all of our toolpaths and then we're actually gonna go and make this part because a lot of you out there have told us, you know, you guys do a really good job at showing us how to design parts and how to add all the toolpaths, but you never actually cut anything. Well, it turns out we're gonna prove you wrong. Today we are going to actually go and do all of the above and cut our part as well. So this mold is a two-part aluminum mold, and this is what we call a six-up. So this is gonna make six of the same thing. Now you're probably wondering to yourself, what is the thing that this makes? Well, I can show you right here. It's this candle. Now I know this looks like a bomb, but it's really just a candle. So don't worry, you're not in danger over there. But this is gonna be able to produce six of these candles in this mold at the same time. This is supporting a local business right here in Colorado. And I think you can use all of the same things you're gonna to learn today for your business. Cool. So let's jump right into Fusion 360. We're gonna go and design everything we need and we're gonna go and make this work cool so here we are in fusion and to correct actually what i said this particular live stream is not going to be about designing the mold itself but rather taking that mold and turning it into something you could actually go and cut so this is going to be focusing on that best practice and that I described in the description. And if you read that description, you probably saw the spoiler alert that I put in there about what we're actually doing today. And what we're doing is we're creating a different body for each of the different states that this thing is gonna look like after it's done with your setup. So when you first start out, you're gonna end up with a block of material, a piece of stock. And then you're gonna go and machine your part, but you can't machine the whole part in this case all in one setup. So when you're done with setup number one and you wanna go and transition to setup number two, you kind of already have an idea of what that shape of the part's gonna look like. And rather than just simulate it using the actual final part, we're gonna go and get you a much more accurate solution. And I think you're gonna like what you see. So let's actually look at what we have here. We have our two part mold. And in this particular case, we have our clamps on the side to help hold it together. And if we hide our clamps for a moment, go and do that, you'll see we have our two-part mold and I'm calling them side A and side B. It's pretty standard. Let's go and hide side B and take a look at side A. And this, of course, looks exactly like it did you know, in my hands just a moment ago. Uh, but what we're gonna focus in on is how to take this and actually put the toolpaths on. So we're gonna go and create a piece of a body for each of the states that it's gonna look like. So if this is the final result, this is most certainly not gonna be what we start with. What we start with is a piece of stock, and I'm calling this stock for setup 01, side A, because I also have a side B that I'm gonna to have to do later. And I also added in parentheses, initial stock. So this is what we're gonna start with at the very beginning. And then once we machine the top half of this mold, it's gonna look like stock for setup number two, right? This is what it's gonna look like. Then we're gonna go and actually create setup number two. This is gonna be the stock. It's gonna be flipped upside down in this case. But what the part's gonna look like once setup number two is complete is gonna look like this, right? And this still is not actually the final part because in this particular case, if we zoom in, you'll see that I don't have any chamfers modeled on stock for setup number three, but I do have chamfers on the final part. So there's still a difference there as well. So again, we're gonna go for setup number three. We're gonna start off, sorry, for setup number two, we're gonna start off with a stock that looks like this. We're gonna end up with a stock that looks, sorry, a part that looks like this. 
And then we're gonna use this for the stock for setup number three. And what's the final part gonna look like after setup number three? Well, that's gonna be just your final part. So let me show you how we're gonna go and do this. This is kind of just a preview of what to expect in the end, all right? So we're gonna jump to another file. Oh, and actually, before I jump to the other file, let me show you this in action because only seeing it will you really be able to believe it. So we're gonna jump from the design workspace over to manufacture. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna repeat basically the same thing I just said, but I think that this will illustrate the point a little bit better. And we're gonna start off with the top part of this mold. The yellow is the stock. And the part that we're gonna end up with is going to be this guy, the stock for setup number two. I'm keeping in mind that this is really setup number one that we're dealing with. We're gonna add all of the different tool paths. Right now I have to go and regenerate them so you'll see them accurately. And if I go and I show you a simulation of this, at the very end of this particular simulation, you're gonna see everything, you're gonna see the part look like it should when it's done, right? So you don't have to worry about what does it really look like? And then when you go to the next setup, what am I really starting with? Because if you have a disparity there between what you think you're starting with and what you're actually starting with, that's when you can go and break cutters or have collisions and things like that that you very much want to avoid. So we want to avoid all of that and accuracy is a great way to do that. So we're gonna come in here and I'll show you the simulation. Now we're gonna add quite a few tool paths on here. I'm gonna show you the stock and we're gonna go and start this up. We're gonna do some facing. The next operation is gonna be adaptive clearing for the outer contour of this part. Fast forward a little bit. Then we're gonna go and do a 2D contour for finishing that outer. Then we're gonna go in here and we're gonna do a 2D adaptive clearing to create the mating geometry between my two mold halves. I'll speed that up quite a bit. And then we're gonna go in here and do a finishing pass on the same areas. Then we're gonna focus in on these little bumps, these alignment pins, so to speak. And we're gonna go and machine all of those. And then we're gonna do a 2D contour for chamfering. And then finally, we're gonna go in and we have a pattern here. Let me actually go and it looks like I didn't simulate the whole thing. We're gonna jump ahead a little bit and we're gonna start machining each of these little areas for like the candles, right? And I have a pattern so that I can only worry about machining one of them and then just create the pattern to be able to create all the rest. But that makes my life quite a bit easier as well. We'll go and save that. And then when we're talking about setup number two, well, the part that comes off of setup number one is really what you're starting with for setup number two. And that's part of why I recommend modeling each of these different shapes. So when we talk about setup number two and we go and generate that real quick, you'll see here when we go and look at this, that our stock that we're starting with is actually this shape, like the final shape from setup number one. And then we're gonna end up with a very different shape Let's go and simulate that. We'll end up with this shape. And we'll skip to the very end and you can see that right here. So this is the general idea and let's go and put that in action. You'll see how this works and then we'll start adding the tool paths and then it will really make a lot of sense. So if it's not clicking right now, please bear with me. This is very much worth it, okay? So we're gonna start with the same file. This one, however, does not have all the work that I just showed you. Instead, we're gonna start it from scratch. At this point, all you have, let's go to the design area and take a look under the hood, so to speak. We have the two mold halves and the two clamps. We can go and hide the clamps. And we'll also hide side B and just focus on side A. And I don't have any other bodies in this at, at this point. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and create a sketch. And that sketch is gonna represent the stock that I'm starting with. Although I could define that in the manufacturer workspace, Part of this best practice is actually defining it here in the design workspace. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and create a sketch and I can start wherever I'd like, but we're gonna go and start on, we'll go and grab a construction plan. And I have one for the very front face of this part. So at the very top of this alignment pin. And we're gonna go and create a sketch there and I'm gonna go and hit P for project and I'm gonna project the entire body like this entire part and say, okay. Now I'm gonna go and hide the body and I'm gonna turn this whole thing by double clicking, I select it all. And I'm gonna hit the letter X, shortcut for construction or this button right here, whichever you prefer. And we're gonna go and draw a new rectangle 
that this is going to represent the actual stock. And we're going to go and align this centered automatically. So we're going to go and grab this to here, here to here. I'm going to make these construction as well. We're going to go and make these vertical. Perfect. And then I'm also going to set these to be equal. It's going to provide symmetry. So we're going to go and say equal. Perfect. Let's go and double check that I did that correctly. That looks pretty good. Now I'm going to go and define the stock here. And so maybe I'm going to start with, let's say 20 inches by three inches. Do that. Ah, that was too little. Three and a half. Or maybe we'll make this 3.75. Or actually let's just start with four. Perfect. Now, later on, when I'm going to want to go and change the stock size, right? Because every time I machine this mold, I might have different stock that I start with. Theoretically, I would have to go and find this sketch and then change these values. But I want to make this a whole lot easier to find. So I don't want to have to go hunt and peck through each of the items in my timeline to go find this. I could theoretically just go to the sketch folder and I could name this, you know, sketch stock size, and that would work fine but I'm gonna make it even easier. I'm gonna take advantage of the parameters table. And if you don't use the parameters table, it is awesome. You should totally use it. The parameters table gives you the ability to set key information that will propagate through your entire model, however you'd like. So we're gonna go and jump over there. Modify, change parameters, that's where to find it. And you'll see that I'm already using the parameters table for a variety of other things. But in this case, we're gonna go and make a couple of new ones. We're gonna make one here that says stock length. And we're gonna set this to, let's say 22 inches for now. We're gonna go and make one that's stock uh, width. And we're gonna set that to be four inches. Actually, I make it four and a half so you can see when I change it that, it, that it'll actually modify. And then we're gonna go with stock thickness. And I'm gonna set that to, I think two and a half inches for now as well. And that's good. We're gonna come back to this parameters table and we're gonna use it again in just a little bit. We're gonna go and edit our sketch that we just created. And this time we're gonna go and change these values. So instead of this being 20, I'm gonna to start to type in stock and it's gonna filter and only show me the variables or the parameters that I created before that have that in it. So in this case, it's stock length, thickness, and width. I want length and I'll hit enter. And you can see here, it now changes the value to match what was in the parameters table. And it also shows me FX, which is a little thing that just says function. So it's like a mathematical formula. It is tied to the parameters table. We're gonna go and change this as well from four inches to stock width and hit enter. It's looking pretty good. And that's all I need for now because the thickness is gonna be based on the extrude. So let's go and do that. Perfect. Now, actually, I'm thinking to myself, I want to add one more parameter that might be important. Let's go back to that parameters table, and we're going to go and add one here that's going to be called stock top offset, something like that. And we're going to go with 50 thousands here. And what this is going to drive is how much extra material I have in stock above the top of my part before I start machining it. So I can make sure that I have a nice, perfect, smooth finish on the top of my part. So that's looking pretty good. Let's go take this stock, this sketch rather, and extrude it to make the stock. So I'm gonna go and select my sketch. And actually this sketch only had one closed profile. So based on the last update that we had in Fusion, now it automatically selects. If you only have one profile, it'll automatically select it. So you, you can actually save some time from having to select that. Let me show the original body so we could see it. So I'm actually gonna wanna start this and go downwards. And you could see that when we go downwards into the model, it assumes, Fusion assumes here, that I wanna cut the model. In this case, I don't wanna do that at all. I wanna make a new body. So I go and say new body. The distance here is going to be the stock thickness that I chose earlier. And then if I just say okay, then I don't really have that offset that we talked about to make sure that I get a smooth surface for my stock. So I'm actually gonna change the start and we're gonna go and say offset. And the offset here is gonna be that offset that we talked about. So I'll go and start to type in offset and it shows me that stock top offset. Perfect. So let's go and take a look at this in more detail, but it's kind of hard to see everything because my stock 
is solid and I can't really see it well. So here's another trick for you. You can come in here and right click on the body and go to physical material. And you can actually pretend like this is made out of water or made out of air, which by default are kind of see-through, which makes it easier to be able to see this. Or you could actually go to appearances and override just the appearance. So your choice. In this case, it doesn't matter if I set the like physical properties to water because I'm, I'm not using those properties for anything. But if you prefer, you can actually just set the appearance to water or air, whatever you prefer. I'm gonna go and drag this onto this stock. Now I can see through it much more clearly. This also, this stock is way too big, but I can change this at, at this point. Let's go and do that. I'll move my parameters table quite a bit. And now I can just say, you know what, instead I'm gonna start with a stock that's 21 inches long or 20 inches long. And the width is gonna be instead of four and a half, it'll be 4.25 and everything will adjust. That's the beauty of this parameters table. I'm gonna say, okay. So at this point, what I created is the shape of the stock. And I'll admit that what I did is longer and more time consuming than if I were to have just done this in the manufacturer workspace, right? We have a great way in the manufacturer workspace. If you go from design to manufacture and you create a new setup, as long as you choose the object that you're actually gonna go and machine, in this case, it's gonna be my final part for side A. When we go to the stock area, we can choose a relative size box or even a fixed size box. And I could type in those same dimensions here. So like 20 inches long by four and a half and so on and so forth. And I even can do offsets from the back, from the front, from the top, from the bottom, all of those options are available. And I'll admit that what I did so far was longer, right? It took a little bit more time. When you get better effusion and faster effusion, I think they'll be about the same, right? About, it'll be about a wash. And at this point, by the way, if I were to create a new setup for this part, I would say, let's make a new setup, just like I, I did a second ago. I shouldn't have canceled it. I'm gonna say, I wanna machine side A. And for the stock, instead of using a relative size box or fixed size box, I could say from solid and I could choose that geometry, that body that I showed earlier. The only other thing that I'm gonna to wanna to do here that I think would be very important, make sure that the Z is face, facing the right direction and also make sure that your stock point or your G54 is where you want it to be. And it could be the top dead center, which is default infusion, or more likely the back left corner, which is incredibly common. That's what I prefer to use myself. So I'm gonna go and say, okay, perfect. Let's go back to the design area because we're not done yet. So if I were to take that stock and start machining it, I'm not gonna end up with that final part after my setup number one is done, right? I'm gonna have something else. So the way that it would normally work if you were not listening to my awesome advice today is you would go into, let's say the manufacturer environment, you created your setup, and then now you're gonna go and add your tool path. And just to illustrate the point drive it home as much as possible. We're gonna go and do a 2D adaptive clearing and we're gonna use the bottom edge. Let's actually select our tool and then this will make more sense. We're gonna go and use the bottom edge to select where we're gonna to cut to. But we're gonna go and use the one inch long end mill is perfect for roughing here. And when I go to geometry, I'm gonna go and we'll go and hide this body and I'll go and pick the very bottom edge of this Perfect. But what typically you probably are gonna do is you're gonna to go to heights and you're gonna say that the bottom height, instead of using the selected contour, you're gonna say like minus 0.05. You know, go 50 thousandths below the bottom of the part. And once you do that, you're gonna end up with a part that, let's wait for that to calculate. Let's go and simulate this for a second. When we go and hit play and we fast forward to the very end, looks kind of like this, right? And you could tell that when I go to setup number two and setup number three, I'm gonna have to go you know, flip this part. And if I try to face this right away, I'm gonna end up with an overhang, which is not good machining practice. So what I'm probably gonna do is I'm gonna do an adaptive clearing all the way around to get rid of the overhang. Then I'm gonna go and face this off. And then the very last thing I'm gonna wanna do is I'm gonna wanna go and chamfer that sharp edge. But the alignment might not be perfect between the part 
and the chamfered edge because I'm using the corner of my stock as my reference and not the corner of the material. So what I'm gonna do here is I have setup number one where we cut the top of the part. Setup number two, we're gonna cut the back side of the part. We're gonna do that adaptive clearing and we're gonna face it off. But for the alignment of the chamfer, I'm gonna do setup number three. And instead of using the corner of the stock, I'm gonna use the corner of the actual part because at that point, that part is gonna be exposed. So we're gonna end up having three setups in this particular model. And the reason that we're gonna end up modeling the shape for each of these is to make sure that we get everything accurate. And you'll see that this actually goes very quickly. So let's go back and go over to the design area and let's model what this is gonna look like after we're done with setup number one. And by the way, I guess before we do that, we should start naming things because naming things is a great way to be able to keep track of it. So we're gonna call this stock or setup zero one, or if you prefer initial stock, and that's good. All right, we're happy with that. And if I show it again, it's like semi transparent. Cool. Then the next thing I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna copy stock for setup number one. Control C is what I'm doing on my keyboard, by the way, because you can't see it. And then Control V for paste. If you're using a Mac, that's awesome. Command C and Command V will do the same thing. So now I have this second uh, copy of the stock. And I'm also gonna go and take side A and we're gonna go and copy and paste that as well. Cool. And now we're gonna hide everything besides those copies. So now what you're looking at are the copies. And now we should talk a little bit about, you know, how far do we want to cut below the part to get that shape that we talked about earlier. And when I did it the old fashioned way, so to speak, I chose 50 thousandths. That could work fine. You could do whatever you'd like. And what we're going to do is since we're using that parameters table to control most of this stuff, I'm going to go back to that parameters table and we're going to add one more here. And this is going to be called depth. No, no, we're going to change that. Cutting depth below part. And we're gonna go and make this, uh, we're gonna go with 100 thousands just to be safe. Good. So here we have that. And what I'm gonna go do at this point is I'm gonna go and make a plane, like a construction plane that'll make my life easier to be able to get to that depth. So let's actually, let's hide all that stuff again. Let's show the original part. Let's make an offset plane from the bottom. And I could drag this wherever I want, but more importantly, I'm gonna type in the value, cutting depth below part, and I'm gonna hit okay. And then I'm gonna confirm that this looks good by zooming in here. And this is indeed below the part, you know, approximately 100,000. Awesome, cool. So now that I have that, we're gonna go and turn on our copies. Actually, we'll just turn on this one, wrong one. There we go. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that same sketch that we used earlier and we're going to extrude this sketch and for how deep we're going to extrude it we're actually going to start at that plane and then we're going to go up all the way through the part let's go and show our bodies and i'm going to go and say cut and everything is mostly looking good oh, hold on a second something's a little funny that one more time there we go and i'm going to say okay so now what I ended up with, let's hide the sketch, is I have kind of like the bottom part of that initial stock, that's what I wanted. And then I have the top of this part. And that's looking pretty good. And so what I'm gonna do at this point, and there are a couple of ways you could do this, is I'm gonna get rid of the chamfers, and then we're gonna move the bottom down, match, and we'll just combine it all together. So a great way to do that is to show a side view like this, and I'm gonna use the box selector and I'm gonna select everything inside this box, just like that. Uh, but I don't want the actual bottom, so I'm gonna deselect that part. And I'm gonna hit the delete key on my keyboard, which got rid of the chamfer. And adds this little feature here that's called delete face. If, ne if you guys have never seen that before, that is a great trick to get rid of chamfers, fillets, or anything else you don't like. So there it is, it's gone. Then I'm also gonna go and use the replace face command, and I'm gonna replace the very bottom of this part with the plane that we created earlier. And so it just moves down the bottom of this part, and that's looking pretty good. 
and then we'll go and combine this together. And now that that's combined together, I have this new body, but we're gonna change the name. This is gonna be called stock for setup 02. And if you prefer to like help you remember this stuff, you could also call this what your part should look like after setup 01 right so the key here is that setup number one you're starting with this big box and your goal is to end up with this part that you now see on the screen this one not this one because realistically you're never going to end up with this part at most you're going to end up with this one if you'd like to be able to tell them apart a little bit more easily, you can simply change the colors. So I'm gonna go and use appearance here, and I'm gonna go and make this a super awesome pastel blue that I like. There we go. So now let's show them all. The gray is the final part that I want. The semi, like the see-through one is the setup for the stock for setup one. The bluish one is the stock for setup number two, but it's also what the part should look like after setup number one is done. Okay, so then let's continue on. So now I have this part, but I wanna show what this is gonna look like after setup number two is done, right? So we're gonna go and take this and I'm gonna go and hit Control C and Control V again. Let's go and rename this. And this is gonna be called stock for setup number three, what your part should look like after setup number two. There we go. And I'm gonna change the color of this one as well. This one's gonna be a glossy red. Of course, change the colors to whatever you want. Really doesn't matter. Cool, so here we have a red. But right now, the blue one and the red one match each other. We don't exactly want that. So there are a couple of ways I could do this. If you remember, I'm gonna be flipping the part over. And my goal at this point is to get rid of the overhang and then also face the part. So one of the ways that I could do this is I can go and select this surface and these faces. So, and I could use that delete key just like I did before. So I'm gonna go and hit the delete key and now it shows the part like this. So the overhang is gone at this point, but there's still a whole lot of extra material left. So if I'm gonna face this at the same time, then the red is not currently looking like the end result that I want. So I could also go and use that replace face command if I'd like. Let's go and do replace face. And I'm gonna select this face right over here. And then for the target face, I wanna select the back side of side A, right? Like the final part. And it's hard to select it here. And you probably know this, you could turn off the light bulb and now be able to select it, no problem. But if you have a hard time being able to see it, then here's another alternative for you. Let's do that again. We're gonna to go to modify, replace face, select the source face, that's no problem. And then now we're gonna go and pick this target face. And for that, I'm gonna select where I know that face is, and I'm gonna select and hold. And when I do that, it brings up this little dialog box, and it lets me pick, you know, did you really mean, Jason, to pick one of these other things that you couldn't reach? So let's go and scroll through it and see if any of these are what I wanted. And it turns out that this one right here is exactly what I want. So you can go and do that, no problem. Now I did get a little bit of a warning here that I did not expect today. Uh, super fun stuff when you're doing live streams. And I have the feeling I know why that happened and we can go and fix that super easy. The reason is because the target face that I selected is slightly smaller than my source face right? It has to know where, where you want it to end up. So there are a couple of ways that I could go about doing this. The one that I'm going to do for now is we're going to go and we're going to hide our stock for setup number three. And I'm simply just going to make an offset plane on the back of this part. And I'm going to do an offset of zero. I'm going to say, okay, that's good enough. And then, or oh, I should have named my planes before. So the first plane that we created, what was that? That was the cutting depth cutting depth below part. And then this other plane that we just made is gonna be the back of final part. Cool. All right, so let's do that replace face again. This time it is going to work great. We're gonna say modify, replace face, select the source face, and then the target face can also be a plane. So we're gonna say the back of there and say okay. And this is looking really good. 
And you're probably wondering why I bothered to do this, like for stock for setup number three. But let's go and zoom in. Remember that the back side of this part, after you get rid of the overhang and you face off the part, is not going to have that chamfered edge. And so I want to make sure, again, that this is accurate. And this is going to allow me to confirm that I have all the tool paths I need and nothing more to be able to create my part. So this truly is what it's going to look like after setup number two is done. And then once I add my tool paths for setup number three, then side A, this is also going to be my final part. And maybe I'll also add that to my, you know, my description here. Final part. That's, that's good enough. Cool. But now that we have all of that, let's go over and start fixing things, right? And actually, we're going to jump over to manufacture. And we're going to just start from scratch because I don't want us to be bogged down by stuff we already have. Let's start from scratch. Cool. Excellent. And by the way, if you've already learned a whole lot, please make sure to put in the comments the number of things that you've learned. I always love seeing your comments and seeing how many things you guys learn from these videos. I really like it. And so please make sure to let us know how much you're learning, if you're enjoying these kind of videos, if there are other video topics you wanna to hear about, please let us know. We love to hear from you. Thank you. All right, so let's jump back over to our screen share. So we're gonna start off from scratch. So we're gonna create a setup for setup number one. We are, what are we gonna be machining? Well, let's start with our stock actually. We're gonna go and say from solid for our stock and we're gonna pick stock for setup number one. And then for what are we actually gonna machine? What's the model we're gonna machine? It's actually gonna be the stock for setup number one. And then that same thing in parentheses, what your part should look like after setup number one is done. That's what we want. And then for our coordinate system, Z is already facing the right way. We're just gonna go and use that back left corner and we're gonna say, okay, this is pretty good. And we're gonna call this what it should be, setup zero one. And if you want some little notes, top only, something like that. Now I'm not gonna add the tool paths yet. We're just gonna create the setups and then we'll go in and add all those tool paths. So now we're gonna do and create another setup. This time, let's go and pick the stock and we're gonna again use from solid. And what are we going to start with? Well, we're gonna start with stock for setup number two that part that has the overhang, right? And then for what are we actually gonna machine? That's gonna be the stock for setup number three or what the part should look like after setup number two is done. Not what the final part is, what the stock should, what the part should look like after you finish machining setup number two, right? So the way, an easy way to think about it, uh, I misselected somehow. There we go. Well, the way you should think about it is stock is what you start with, and this is what you end up with after this particular setup. And it looks like my orientation is off, so we're gonna go and select a new Z axis, and we can use any of the models for this, it doesn't really matter, uh, but we're gonna go and pick the Z to face up, and then for the stock point, we're gonna use the back left corner of the overhang for this one. That's my choice, you could pick whatever you'd like, but that's how I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say okay. We're gonna go and rename this. This is gonna be setup zero two, and I'm gonna call this overhang and facing. Good. And then once we do that, we're gonna do a final setup. And that final setup, what are we starting with? We're starting with stock for setup number three. And this time we're gonna end up with the final part because we only have three setups. Go and select that a little bit better. And then for our Z axis, that's facing the wrong way. So we'll select a new one. That's now correct. And most importantly, because of the way that I picked the stock to match the correct model, when I go to my stock point at this point and I pick this back left corner, let's go pick that a little more accurately. This is the back left corner of the final part. And that is exactly what I'm gonna see in real life. So that's exactly great. And this, cause this is gonna allow me to do the chamfer and have everything match align correctly. Cool. So let's go and rename that as well. So this is gonna be setup 03, and this is gonna be final chamfer. And now we're good to go. All right, we have gotten to the fun part. Now we're gonna add the tool paths. So let's go and activate the first setup, and we're gonna go and start off with a facing operation. I'm gonna go and say 2D face, 
I'm going to select my tool. And in this case, I have a whole bunch of tools that I was already planning to do for, use for this project. So we're going to go and use this face mill. And I don't have to worry about any of these other options here because for facing, it's really easy. I just hit OK. And if I want to, I can come in here and I could do multiple step downs. That might be a good thing. So we're going to say multiple depths. I'm going to choose a maximum step down of 50 thousandths. Nope, 50 thousandths. And I'm also going to add a finishing pass. And the finishing pass is maybe going to be 5,000. And I'm going to go and say OK. Next thing we're going to go do is we're going to do an adaptive clearing to get rid of all the material around these like nubs here. So we're going to say 2D adaptive clearing. For our tool, we're going to go and use an end mill. I'm going to go and use this short one inch end mill. I think that'll be perfect. And then for geometry, I'm going to go and select this edge right here. Zoom in a little bit, this edge. And you can also play around with the arrows to make sure that you're getting the geometry outside of that region, not inside. This is looking pretty good. Perfect. Oh, and one other thing to keep in mind, actually, I should have done this already, is when I'm talking about like what I select for setup number one, remember that this, what I'm showing right now is the final part. That's not what the part's going to look like after setup one is done. So I recommend showing the material, like what it's going to look like when setup one is done and selecting everything from that model. And you'll see why in a minute, this will make a lot more sense. So facing, I didn't have to select anything, so that's easy. We're going to go back to adaptive clearing. We'll go and reselect that one inch flat end mill. And for geometry, this time I'm going to select it from this model. And this is looking pretty good. I'm going to go around here and select all six of these. Excellent. And we're going to go and say, oh, let's also make sure we're leaving a little bit of extra stock. So this is kind of more of a roughing operation. And then we're going to go and do a finishing operation for this as well. And for that, I'm going to take advantage of one of the tricks of the trade, which is going to be creating a derived operation. Because if I just create a new operation, like if I just go to 2D and let's say I want to do a 2D pocket, I have to go and select all six of those holes again. And I don't want to have to do that. So instead, not holes, the edges. But so instead, I'm going to say, let's actually create a new derived operation from this. Let's go and make a 2D pocket. It uses the same tool. It uses the same geometry, same heights, and all that stuff. So in this case, all I'm going to do is change the passes. And we're going to uncheck the stock to leave so that this is going to be a finishing pass. Say OK. Let's actually review what we have so far. So we'll go and simulate. I'm going to turn on the stock. We're going to do a nice standard um, simulation here. And I like for colorization this operate, not operation. That's not what I want. I want comparison. And comparison is cool because it shows you what you still have to machine. And also, if you gouge into your part, it's going to show you that as well, which is super important. So this is going to, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. And what I care about the most is what the final result looks like. So bluish purple is showing you what you still have to machine. Green is saying this is good to go. And this is looking great, right? So the top was faced off how I wanted, and I still have some material here. I'm going to have to go and actually remove that material. So let's go and continue. We're going to go and say, we're going to do a two, no, we're going to start with 3D, and we're going to do maybe a spiral tool path, or maybe I'm going to choose scallop. Your choice, what you prefer. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with my gut. We're going to go with scallop. I'm going to change my tool from that one inch flat end mill. And we're gonna go with a bull nose end mill, but I want a small one. So we're gonna go with this one eighth short bull nose. That's looking pretty good. And for now, we're gonna go for geometry. And I'm gonna use this cool feature called avoid or touch surface. So I'm gonna select this surface right here. And I'm gonna say, I want to, instead of avoiding it, I actually wanna to touch it. And if you never, if you ever encounter a tool like this and you're not sure how it works or how to use it, simply hover your mouse over the option and it'll actually show you what to expect. So in this case, it's showing you what you want. I say I want to touch the surface and I'm going to go and say OK. And let's go and see what the toolpath is going to look like for this. It looks like I need a lot more step downs to get that kind of geometry. So we're going to go and edit that. And under passes here, we're going to make our step over much, much more fine. So we're going to go with uh, 5,000. 
perfect. It's going to now go and create that toolpath, and that's looking much better. Cool. So let's go and simulate that, and I'm going to go and skip forward to that operation in particular. We're going to go and hit that play button. This is looking pretty good. Moving around our parts, speed it up even more. Let's skip to the end, maybe. Awesome. That's exactly what I wanted. So now that that's looking good, I could now either make multiple operations, one for each of these like dome alignment pins, or I could just go in here and edit this. And under the geometry where I picked my touch surfaces, I could simply also select the other ones as well. Good. So now it's gonna go and calculate the toolpath for all six of those different locations. I expect the same exact result for all six because the first one was looking good and I'm super happy with that. Now let's go and add our outer shape. Like let's actually start to cut the material to match the shape. And this is where you're gonna see the beauty of this technique that I'm showing. Perfect. So let's go and do a 2D adaptive clearing, like a roughing strategy that keeps a constant tool engagement. We're gonna go back and choose one of those one inch end mills, but I want the long one because I'm gonna cut a little deeper here. So we're gonna go and use that long one. And for the geometry, instead of having to pick the bottom of the final part and then having to choose how much further I wanna go down beyond it, because I modeled my part to represent what I want this to look like when it's done machining, setup number one, all I have to do is select this particular edge and I'm good to go. In this case, I'm leaving the stock to leave option on so that this is more of a roughing strategy. I'm gonna go and say okay. And then I'm gonna go and say 2D pocket. And I could choose that same geometry. Or just as a reminder for what I showed before, I could also instead right click on the 2D adaptive that I had just made and make a derived 2D pocket from it. And that will automatically have selected that geometry. In this case, it's only one edge, so it doesn't really matter. And I'm also not tweaking the heights because I'm selecting an edge that I modeled. So I think this is super easy. Either one, you know, either method is great. I am gonna make sure to turn off stock to leave here because this is gonna be a, uh, oh, and I have to, in this case, I do have to make sure to pick it. But this is gonna be my finishing operation. Cool. So there we go, and I have that shape. And everything is looking pretty darn good, I think. The only things we have left at this point are going to be the actual like the bomb shapes, you know, like the cavity for the candles and then also the chamfering of the edges. So let's actually verify that. We're going to go and simulate this and we're going to go and just skip to the very end for a quick gut check. It, the red bar that you see at the bottom here is our, our software calculating everything to make sure it's accurate. And so far I see everything is green and that's really good. If I zoom in here, let's actually hide that. Everything's looking great. So let's go and start machining those pockets, those cavities. So the next thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is I'm gonna say, let's do another 3D operation. And this time we're gonna go and do, we are gonna do adaptive clearing, but I wanna keep the adaptive clearing inside a region that's like this cavity. And instead of having to worry about the cavity, like everything being inside this region, I actually, I'm willing to let the cutter go a little bit outside this area in this direction only. So a couple of ways I could do this. I could create a sketch and confine the tool to that sketch, or I can actually create a surface and do the same thing. And in my opinion, I like doing the surface method. So let's actually go and do that. I'm gonna jump back over to the design workspace. And we're gonna go and switch to the surface tab. This is, by the way, a great time to tell you that if your toolbars don't look like the ones that you see on my screen, it's because we have a new user interface that right now is an option. You get to turn on or not. Soon it will be required for everyone. So this is kind of like a transition period, but it's right now it's an option. And so you might not have it turned on if you don't see what I see on my screen. So we're gonna go to your name in the top right corner and click on preferences. And then here under preview, there's one here that says UI preview. Check that box and then restart fusion. And then you'll see everything that looks like mine. Look on my end. We're gonna go and do an offset on the surface toolbar. And I'm gonna select the very first of these cavities and we're gonna do an offset of zero. And I'm gonna say okay. 
Let's hide the solid body. This is what we're going to use to confine our space. But if we go and look at this part, remember that there's actually a chamfer that I modeled. I choose to model all my chamfers. Not everyone does. And I want to extend some things to make this work better. So we're going to go to extend. And I'm going to select everything here. And we're going to extend that up just a little bit. We're going to go with maybe an eighth of an inch. And then I'm also going to go and extend this this direction. And this is where I'm choosing, this is the important part actually, where I'm choosing how far past the cavity I'm willing to machine to get a nice, really good smooth, smooth surface. I'm gonna go with a quarter of an inch, but you could choose whatever you'd like. Pardon me there, okay. So I have my surface, but I extended a little bit too far past the center line. So we're gonna go and use my plane here and I'm gonna just go and trim this. I'm gonna use this tool. I'm gonna get rid of this extra part on top and say okay. And now this is looking really good. So if I look at my final part or I look at you know, what this is gonna look like after the setup, my surface is lined up perfectly with that top edge and it extends a quarter of an inch. This is awesome. And this is gonna be called you know, for machining boundary perfect so let's go and make this work we're going to go back to the manufacturer workspace i'm going to just regenerate my tool paths they're all going to be the same as before but now i'm not going to get a red warning and we're going to go and add a new tool path and this one that i'm going to choose we're going to do a 3d and i'm going to do a scallop actually no we said we're going to do a roughing so we're going to do 3d adaptive clearing to start I'm gonna go and use another end mill, but I don't think I'm gonna use that one. We're gonna go and use maybe this 3 eighths. No, we're gonna go and use a half inch bull nose. I think that'll be good enough. And then for the geometry, we're gonna go and confine this to be inside uh, this area that we want. So this contour, I could actually just go and select this shape and it automatically is gonna stay within the Perfect. And we're going to go and say, okay, let's go and take a look at that toolpath once, once it's created. And that's okay. It's not like perfect. It's not really getting as deep in there as I'd like. So I'm going to also consider using a smaller, oh no, actually I just didn't wait long enough. There we go. So the toolpath actually did get in there. Nice. Cool. So that was a nice roughing strategy, but actually I want to make sure to leave a little bit extra material than I see here. Let's go with maybe 75 thousandths. I think that's gonna be cool. So I'm gonna go and use that. That's a great roughing strategy. Now let's go and do our finishing of that region. So we're gonna go and say 3D toolpath. This time we are gonna go and use scallop. And scallop has a cool feature here where I get to do that touch surfaces, just like I did when I did spiral. And so I'm gonna say, I want to touch these surfaces and I wanna use that surface. Now, sometimes when you select it in this window, it'll select a specific face instead of the entire body. So my recommendation is if you have a, a surface body with multiple faces, select it here in this drop-down list. And it'll select the entirety of the body. And that's what I want here. And I'm gonna go and say, okay. Before I do, I'll just double check everything else. And it's looking pretty good. Nice. Nice, and that's gonna be my finishing. So let's go and actually change my step down and we're gonna do our step over actually. And we're gonna go and do maybe 50 thousandths. Now, of course, the specifics here, you choose whatever works best for you. All right, we're about to get to the really good stuff here. By the way, I also wanna go and chamfer this edge. So we're gonna go and say 2D contour. There are, by the way, two ways to do this, 2D contour and 2D chamfer. I am not going to cover in detail how you choose which one of these for this video, but we do have several videos that cover that, and we can put a link to that in the description here. But I'm going to go and use 2D Contour, and I'm going to change this to be a chamfer mill. I think it'll be uh, do a much better job at chamfering. So we're going to go and use a chamfer mill. And then for the geometry, I'm also going to go and pick this edge. And the reason is that if you do 2D contour, instead of picking the bottom edge of a modeled chamfer, 
you actually want to choose the edge of like where the three D model would be if you didn't have a chamfer at all. That's like the quick and dirty. So I'm going to select this surface because that represents the same thing. Uh, but I don't want it to go across here as well. So I'll go and select and hold, and I can choose this to be an open contour. And let's go and say OK. Up, oh, and I actually didn't select it. Let's go and fix that. I'll go and select this one more time, and this time I'm going to walk this around my surface. Around, like walking the dog. Walk all the way around and hit that accept. And now this is looking like I want it. If I want this to start a little bit further out, I can also come in here and uh, change my option. Where is it? Nope. Ah, here it is. Under geometry, we're going to go and add a tangential extension. I'll go and add maybe an eighth of an inch. So it's actually going to extend the start and the end of this like tool path so that you get a nice lead in and lead out how you want it. And then for passes, this is where it's important to get this right for chamfering. This is where you specify the width of the chamfer. You could see that here in this uh, little tooltip kind of thing. So this is going to be five thousandths for me. And then the tip offset is the like how far down you want the tip of the tool to go just slightly past this so that you're not using the very tip of the cutting edge. And so we're going to go with uh, 0.005 here as well. You choose whatever values you'd like. Um, at this point, let's go and simulate what we have to make sure that this is looking awesome. And then we're going to move on to the next stage. And I could already tell based on the timing so far, this is going to be a little bit of a longer um, live stream, but I think you're going to get a lot of value from it. So we're going to charge ahead and get through all of this. So let's actually cut to the very end here. That's really where I like to end up because that shows me the comparison of like what I'm getting versus what I'm expecting. And again, I want green. I want everything to look really good. And so let's actually wait for this to finish. And actually over here, it looks like I have a, a collision because my tool is a little bit too short. So let's actually go and change that. Let's see what we're using here. We're using the half inch. And it looks like I chose a half inch that's a little bit too short. So what I could also do, I could either change this tool to one that's longer, or I could actually just go back in my library and find a different tool. So let's actually go in and show you a cool way to filter tools. We can go in our library and we could filter by type. So I want to only look at bullnose end mills. Now I have a much smaller option, set of options. And I want my half inch, but I want the long version of my list. And I could also filter this by dimensions. So if I want to only look at diameters that are between uh, 3 eighths and 3 quarters or something, now it's actually filtering by that and only showing me what's available. So we're going to go and start for roughing. We're going to go and do that half inch long. Let it recalculate everything for me. Nice. And then we'll go and simulate that again and just verify that this is all good. Remember, the key is you create tool paths and then you simulate and then you create your tool paths, you know, edit your tool paths and you simulate. That's a iterative process until you get what you want. Let's scroll all the way to the very end. Wait for this red bar to finish calculating. Excuse me, because that's how you know that it is uh, accurate. Um, I do have a collision right here, as it turns out. And that is on my scallop toolpath. So I might need to use a longer tool or a bigger tool that's also longer. And that makes sense. I'm actually colliding right here. And let's, that's interesting. Why is that happening? Let's go and see that. Oh, that one more time. We're going to go and take a look at that and solve it. That's kind of the more fun parts of these live streams. I could also, by the way, turn on this stop on collision and then just hit the play button. I could even speed this up and then it'll get to the exact right spot. So this is the scallop toolpath that it's doing this to. I'm not 100% sure why. We're going to go and take a look at it and find out. We're going to go to the edit and we're going to go to geometry. And you can see here that right now we're containing the tool center on the boundary. But we could also do this to say I want to keep the tool inside the boundary. And that's likely going to help us quite a bit here. Let's go and do that. Let it recalculate and then go and double check this. Now, if this does not solve it, I'm just going to tell you flat out right now, guys, as much as I'd love to solve this on the spot for you, 
I don't want you to waste your time watching me figure this out. Instead, I want to show you the stuff that you're going to learn the most from. And so if this doesn't solve it, I'm going to skip ahead and just continue. So warning, I'm going to skip ahead and continue if I need to. Let's go and simulate this and see what we get. And we have that stop on collision. And I'm not actually seeing any collision so far. Uh, no red warning, so that's awesome. I think this might be good to go. Now you're probably wondering, uh, what about the other cavities? Because I haven't done anything for those yet. So let's say I like this cavity. I've done my roughing, I've done my finishing, I've done my chamfering, all of that kind of stuff. And this actually looks great. Um, I probably maybe change my refinement on the step over, but let's say that this is good. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna go and measure the distance from one of these to the other. And I could do that right here if I'd like. So we're gonna go and measure from, let's say this corner right over here, and we'll go and measure the same corner right over there. And that distance is 2.875, I'll go and copy that. Perfect. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose which of these toolpaths apply to just that cavity. And that would be the 2D contour, the scallop, and the adaptive clearing. I select all three of them, <clears throat> I right click, and I say, let's add this to a new pattern. The pattern is going to be a linear pattern. For the direction, I'm gonna say it's gonna go along the length of this part. We're gonna flip that direction, and then for the distance, we're gonna go and paste that value. And you can see that it lines up perfectly, of course. Then I'm gonna go and say, instead of two of these, there are actually gonna be six of these, because this is a six up uh, mold. And I get to choose now the operation order. This is pretty awesome stuff. If you choose preserve order, it's gonna go and do everything for one part, uh, sorry, one cavity, and then move on to the next cavity, do that whole cavity, and then move on to the next, and the next, next. Your choice, whichever one you prefer, there are a number of reasons why you might choose one or the other, but you get to choose. Do you wanna do each cavity, whole thing, and then move on to the next? Do you wanna do the roughing for each, and then move on to the next? You know, you could choose it by tool, by operation, or by order. And I would say more often than not, I use operation and tool because tool changes are can be the slowest. So I like to keep the same tool throughout. So I'll go and rough all of these cavities and then I'll go and finish all the cavities. But if you wanna verify that like the cavity was done perfectly before you move on to the next, then preserve order is a good choice, okay? So you get to pick whatever you want and we're gonna go and say, okay. That created my linear pattern. So let's say that I've done everything I want for setup number one, and I did a simulation and everything is looking good. Now let's jump over to setup number two. And this is the last two setups here are gonna go fairly quickly, so bear with me. Let's activate setup number two. Let's show what we want. And what we're gonna show here is stock for setup number two, and actually more importantly, what we want this to look like when it's done, because the stock is actually already built into the setup here. You know, when I select it, it shows me in yellow what the stock looks like. So that's actually perfect. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to say, let's go and add some operation. We're gonna start off with maybe, uh, actually, I know what we're gonna start off with. We're not gonna do facing, because we'd end up with that overhang that we don't want. We're gonna do adaptive clearing to get rid of the overhang. We're gonna choose our biggest, shortest cutter that I could use. So we're gonna to go to this tool, we're gonna to go and use, let's get rid of our filters here. We're gonna use the one inch short end mill. And then for geometry, I could select here in this case, but I actually, my goal at this point is not to go straight down to the final surface, but just to get rid of the overhang. So if I go and I show this stock, remember this is the stock that I'm using for setup number two, I could simply select this edge and it's gonna go an adaptive clear right to it. I don't have to worry about changing the heights because it's gonna go and just do it perfectly. And then I'm gonna get rid of the stock to leave because I don't need that either. And we're gonna go and say, okay. That's all I really need for that operation. And then I'll go and hide this guy. And last thing I'm gonna do is we're gonna do a 2D facing operation. We'll go and select our face mill. And just like before, since I selected that the final part I'm gonna end up with is this red one, as opposed to the final part, it knows everything that it needs about this plus the stock that I'm starting with. And so all I have to do is actually say okay, or maybe change just like the, the step downs. 
And so we're going to go with 50 thousandths and we'll do a finishing step of five thousandths. By the way, if you do this kind of thing all the time and you're finding yourself changing these values all the time, simply right click and say, make that the default from now on. Make this the default from now on as well. And then you don't have to worry about, you know, entering that in all the time because it's already set. Perfect. Let's go and review this. Let's simulate it. So let's start off with what our stock looks like. And let's hit the play button. So this is adaptive clearing at its finest, running around our part and getting rid of that overhang. Again, for my probing, I probe in the machine. I'm going to probe to the back left corner of the part. And the part is really like your stock, like what it looked like when it came out of setup number one. And that's going to include that overhang. So I'm probing to the corner of the overhang. Once this is done, let's speed forward quite a bit. It is now fully faced off. I do not have a chamfered edge here. That's not what I, that's exactly what I'd expect. No chamfered edge because now I want to reprobe to this corner and now the alignment's going to be perfect. But this is great. This is actually looking fantastic. Then we're going to go to our setup number 3. And we're going to show the final part and also the stock for setup number 3. The only difference at this point is the chamfer, right? Can see that very clearly the final part is the chamfer and the stock for setup number three does not that top edge and because i happen to use the 2d contour for my chamfering again i'm going to want to select the edge as though there were no chamfer like no model chamfer so we're going to go and choose the chamfer mill chamfer mill well, here it is and then for the edge i'm going to go and select the edge from the stock that's perfect. I'm going to go to passes and I'm going to make sure this is what I want. Five thousands here and also five thousands for the tip offset. We're going to go and say, OK, I have my toolpath. Again, remember that the probing is going to be at the corner here now instead. Let's go and simulate this and hit play. Looking pretty good. And if I don't if I want a little bit more of a tip offset, that would be fine as well. And if I hide all of these, I have my comparison on. Now I'm seeing everything is green because it's looking really good. And just for you guys to know what it would look like if you mess something up, let's go and mess this up on purpose. Maybe we're going to use a chamfer myth, uh, sorry, sorry, a chamfer width of 0.01 or 10 thousandths instead of 5 thousandths. Let's do another simulation. Let's go to the very end here. And I believe we're going to see some red warnings, like red showing us that we have a, uh, uh, like a gouging and then you can see that here at this point it's showing that we're making too big of a chamfer so this is a great reason to model up what you want the part to look like after each setup which in turn is modeling up what the part is like what the stock is going to be for each setup this is a great example of hey you did a 2d contour you added your chamfers did you go too deep did you not go too deep well if you don't model your chamfers and you don't model what you want the part to look like after each setup, you wouldn't be able to use the comparison here to make sure that this is looking. And just for a comparison, if I change this up and instead I made the chamfer too small, let's go and do that as well. So we're going to go and make this, I think that we were saying five thousandths is what we really want. Let's go and make this two thousandths instead. Update that, simulate that, go to the very end. And now you're going to see this in blue and blue is telling you that you did not cut enough. So this is again, great reason to use this methodology. And this example had three setups. So you end up with four bodies. You end up with the final part. You end up with, with stock for setup one, stock for setup two, stock for setup three, and the original, that's all four. And remember that all of this is still parametric. So if you ever need to go and change the size of the stock, it's as simple as saying, let's actually show it here again. Let's go back to that parameters table. Let's change the size of the stock. We're going to go with 19 and a half by four even by two inches tall, something like that. We're going to hit OK. When we get back to the manufacturer workspace, we are going to get all these red warnings telling us that our toolpaths are not up to date but I can select all these setups, hit the generate button, and now it's gonna update everything for that new stock size. 
So it's kind of cool, right? Like in the design workspace, you set up everything, right? How big you want the stock, what you want all the parts to look like at various stages of your machining process. You can also do the same thing and design fixtures and all different kinds of other tools that'll help you. But remember that this is parametric and it still updates with you in real time. And I wanna make sure to be cognizant of what I said at the very beginning, right? Our goal today is to not just show you how to design the tool paths. We're actually gonna go and show you uh, running it, right? So let's actually go ahead and do that. So for that, we're gonna want a couple of things. We're gonna want our, uh, we're gonna want our glasses off. We're gonna want our safety glasses on. And then let's go and jump over and actually make that happen. See you in a minute. Hello everyone, now we're here at Pier 9 in San Francisco. Here we have our Haas VF2 and we're going to go and cut some chips. Now that we finished cutting the mold, Let's go take a look at the results. The two halves fit together perfectly. Everything is looking really good. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day. Don't forget, with Fusion 360, you can make anything.